Hey, Bonehead Weekly. We're back with the interview with Gary Sherman part two. So this part, we're going to deal with basically the 80s on of his career. We're going to talk about one of my favorite movies and actually his favorite movie, Vice Squad. Now, Vice Squad is one of those films almost 40 years later that still holds up it's still grimy and gritty and it kind of makes you feel which is a good thing when you can have that visceral kind of effect on an audience we're also going to talk about poltergeist 3 about the mechanical effects and how it's basically the movie that sets the gold standard for a lot of those so check this out thanks so much gary moving along vice squad is 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 wings hauser just as bad shit crazy as i think that's probably I can phrase that question better, but as you can already pick up on the tone, we're very laid back interview. Well, I, I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again. I, I mean, know, but our I, audience I, has not heard it. <laughs> I knew Wings as Nancy Locke's husband. Um, Nancy Locke is the mother. Uh, you know, in dead and buried, yeah. go in the in the haunted house scene, mm-hmm. and um, I had cast Nancy as as you know in that part in in uh, in dead and buried, and she was married to a guy named Wings Hauser, who was a a soap opera star. Mm-hmm. He was in The Young and the Restless, and he played a character named Greg Foster, who was like the world's nicest person, <laughs> and. Um, uh, well, anyways, Wings played guitar and sang, you know, just for his own pleasure, and so did I. So, and you when, actually, for people, real quick, you've actually played with Clapton, correct? Well, <laughs> that's another story. I'm so, I, mean, I, was, I wasn't I was, trying. I was just trying to get people to know. Just you're not just you were an, you're an actual musician. Yeah, I, I was a session musician at Chess Records. I was the token white at Chess Record Company. <laughs> I, I really was. I mean, I think it was myself and Charlie Musselwhite were the, were the, were the only two white uh, musicians at Chess. Everybody else was black. Um, I guess there are another, you know, maybe another handful of white people occasionally who would come in and work there, but. Uh, um, I was actually, they called me the white kid at chess. They, and nobody knew my name. And they just said the white kid, everybody knew who they were talking about. Yeah. Um, but anyways, and uh, but I, I, I'll get back there. That, that's okay. I didn't mean to interrupt. I just wanted people to yeah. know. Yeah. The, the Yardbirds came in to cut I'm a Man at, uh, at, at or no, they had already cut I'm a Man. They came in to cut their next album after the album that had I'm a Man on it. And uh, um, and they cut shapes of things mm-hmm. at, at chess. And um, as it happened, nobody showed up. And, and as I later found out, it wasn't Clapton. It was Jeff Beck. Yeah. Is Clapton had left the Yardbirds already. I was introduced to Jeff Beck and, as Eric Clapton. <laughs> Ron Malo, the head engineer, thought it was Eric Clapton, but it was actually Jeff Beck. And Jeff didn't want to insult the great Ron Malo by <laughs> correcting him. So I, for, for 40 years, I believed that I had sung with Eric Clapton and I actually had sung with Jeff Beck. That story is yeah. even better than actually having clapped. I mean, I know it would have, you could have said it, but this one's more entertaining. But I, I, I thought for, for 40 years, I thought I had sung <laughs> with Eric Clapton, but you know, I was like 17 years old and I didn't remember what anybody looked like. You know, all English rock and rollers looked the same to me back then. And, um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, and so anyways, uh, it, it was, Marshall Chess finally told me after 40 years or told somebody else that it was Jeff Beck and it wasn't Eric Clapton that I had sung. But anyways, on, on, this, uh, on the song um, Shapes of Things, the person singing Come Tomorrow is me. Awesome. And uh, so if you ever listen to Shapes of Things and you hear Come Tomorrow, that's me. And... <laughs> um, that was my, my claim to fame in rock and roll. Anyhow, um, wings, yeah. So wings, wings. 
So Wings and I used to, yeah, I had a house on a cliff uh, overlooking the ocean in Mendocino that I rented because we were up there for about four months. And um, uh, Wings used to come over with his guitar and, you know, when we were in pre-production and stuff and weekends when we were in production. <clears throat> And we would just play and we got to be really good friends. And we started, we, we'd get, I drank back then. I don't drink now. I mm -hmm. haven't had a drink in 30 years, but um, uh, we'd get drunk and we'd talk. And I, I really learned a lot about Wings that, that he didn't want to admit to anybody. Um, he, uh, uh, he was not Greg Foster. <laughs> he yeah. played Greg Foster. And there was an anger inside of Wings that that when he got really drunk, we would get into talking about. And when I wrote Vice Squad, when I was rewriting Vice Squad and, um, and getting ready to make the movie, I, I was talking to Wings because Wings and I stayed friends and, and you know, we would get together and I said, read this, would you read this part with me? And we would get into actually acting out scenes with Ramrod. Yeah. And, and I got into his, his soul and got that anger and found that anger that had been repressed in him for years. And boy, did, did he help me create Ramrod? Yeah. I mean, and, but but he 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 hated the fact that he could do that, and and I said, do you want to play the part? And he said, you know what, I'd love to play the part. And when I brought it up at the Avco Embassy and said, you know, who, they said, who do you want to play Ramrod? And I said, Wings Hauser. And everybody looked at me like I was fucking crazy, and said, you want Greg Foster to play Ramrod? And Every, everybody knew him as Greg Foster and this ni nice namby pampy guy. I said, I got to tell you, there's, I, I, I've been working with Wings on this, and and I said, let me bring him in. And they said, okay. So there we are. We got Bob Ramey and Blossom Khan and 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 Frank Capra Jr. And they're all sitting at this table and all the other executives from, from Avco Embassy and the producers and everybody. And, uh, and Wings and I had rehearsed this. I, I wrote him a scene basically to, and so I said, okay, I'm gonna bring Wings in. And I opened the door and in comes Wings with a look on his face that could send chills down anybody's spine. And he walks up to the table and he stands right opposite Bob Ramey and he grabs Bob Ramey's tie and he leans into him and he whispers, are you the motherfucker who could play this part? And poor Bob, uh, I, he just shit. <laughs> and he said he raised his hands and he said okay i'm convinced <laughs> and that's how wings hauser became ramrod but it's a great story and you basically changed his image for the rest of his career and he hates me for it does he really yep he says i ruined his life i don't know but but it, so let me say something about five squad is that watching it again it is still after all this time and this is a compliment to you sir it's still it's grimy it, yeah you know what i mean uh, it holds up it, it, it's my favorite of my children you're not supposed to pick a favorite of your children but vice squad is definitely my favorite of. My and favorite. i hope you understand the compliment i'm giving you that i do it it is it's still you feel there's two or three movies that that another one would be cruising which is you know, with pacino right you know, yeah right but that you just feel take any of the exploit you just feel grimy and that sir is a huge compliment that some you're watching it on the screen it's over here and you just feel it 
and that's a that's a that's a visceral effect and that that's hard to obtain so congratulations and I, you, and I yeah. don't know it's, that it's, I knew that you've went on record before to say that that's your favorite. I'm sure, I, and I may have missed it in my research, but it, it still holds up as just, damn, how did they get this picture made? Well, it was Bob Ramey. Bob Ramey, I had fin I just finished Dead and Buried, and it, as you probably have read and is on the uh -huh. commentary uh, on, on the DVD or the Blu-ray was on the DVD too. Yeah. Um, I had a lot of problems with the, in the post-production on, uh, I didn't have problems. I was given a lot of problems on the post-production on Dead and Buried because Dead and Buried kept getting sold from company to company. Yeah. Um, it, was a, it was a negative pickup for Avco Embassy. They were buying the finished movie, but the first production companies got sold to the second production company, which during post-production got sold to a third production company. And the third production company was PSO run by Mark Damon. And to cut the story to really short. Yeah, that's okay. At the screening of my director's cut of Dead and Buried, um, everybody was Bob Ramey, who was the president of AFCO Embassy, was just ecstatic, and everybody was, it was like applause. And, da -da -da -da. and Mark Damon comes up to me and says, Can we talk for a second? Because I just, you know, I now own this movie. And I said, Sure. And he takes me off to a corner and says, Well, it's a good movie. But if I wanted Bergman to direct a horror <laughs> film, I would have hired Bergman. <laughs> now let's I know you're simple. insulted, but it's it's one of those lines that's hard to. Ugh. Yeah, and 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 he just said, "Now well, let's make it into a horror movie." And so they started making changes in the film, and and I just fought, and Bob Ramey fought for me, and you know. Finally, it, it came to a point that that uh, Mark Damon said that they were going to sue me if I if I kept continuing asking for you know mm -hmm. not to make these changes because he was only going to make one negative, and um, uh, he said I need a film that can show in Japan and Europe and boom boom and this film is just too intelligent and yeah you know and the comedy is stupid and which it wasn't mm -hmm. and anyway so they start making and they added a scene and uh the scene with the doctor with the acid up his nose which i hate yeah um and that and stan who knew that i didn't want any of this done refused to do that scene and so they brought somebody else in who did a fucking awful job and yeah. it just looks it looks it's so out of place in the movie that scene and the doctor was one of the townspeople he you know they only killed visit to make any sense that, that that it's even in there yeah and and there and there was no reason to do cover-up because that's not what dobbs was all about mm -hmm. so i mean the, the whole scene makes no sense whatsoever but and it's just stuck in there and they had a re organize the film a little bit to get that scene stuck in there and anyways I, I was really upset and so Jay Cantor who had remained as my mentor said to me don't fight it walk away you're not going to win mm -hmm. so just walk away and he called Bob Ramey and he told Ramey he said you know let Gary walk away. Don't leave him in the middle of all of this because it's only going to be bad for him. And and eventually they'll they'll realize that that the film was better the way he had it. Yeah. And um, which is what happened. And I and I and so Bob Ramey said, "I'll not only let him walk away. I'll give him another movie to do." Because mm -hmm. that's what he should be doing. He should be doing another movie right away. So <clears throat> Bob Ramey called me into his office and uh, put a stack of scripts on the, on the table and said, pick one and we'll start working on it tomorrow. 
And so I went home and read these six scripts. And at the time I was living with a, an executive at, at, uh, uh, at Warner Brothers. She and I had had a relationship for quite a long time. And um, so we, we would lie in bed at night and read scripts together. And uh, you know, as it happened that night, she was reading a script called Nine and a Half Weeks. <laughs> <laughs> And I read Vice Squad and then, and she said, oh, you got to read this script. And, and so she hands me nine and a half weeks and I hand her Vice Squad. So I read nine and a half weeks. I said, wow, this is an amazing script. And she, and she read Vice Squad and she said to me, you shouldn't do this movie. I said, no, I said, I said, hey, I agree with you that the script is fucking awful. Uh, because it was written basically by an amateur uh -huh. and, and then it was rewritten it was written by a guy who was actually a cop yeah and it was and it was what happened to him and then rvo robert vincent o'neill came in and did a little polish on it and they were going to do more work on it and but i just saw something in that script that i thought we could really make work and I told her, I said, oh, I know I want to do a page one rewrite. And Bob said, it's fine if I want to do a page one rewrite. But I love the idea of a film that takes place in one night and is almost real time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and and the whole film's a chase. Yeah. And this guy's a monster. And it, it, it all works for me. So she said, well, yeah, I don't know if you should do it. I said, okay. So anyways, <clears throat> I went back in and saw Bob the next morning and said, I want to do this, but I want to do a page one. And met Robert Vincent O'Neill and we talked about what the changes should be and set out to rewrite the script. But um, so that that's how I came by to do uh, uh, Vice Squad. In the meantime, um, when I was doing Vice Squad, Vice Squad got a lot of publicity while we were doing it because uh, we were shooting in Los Angeles and we were doing all these car chases on Los Angeles streets. And Zalman was hearing about this movie. And so he was having a meeting uh, with my girlfriend at, at Warner Brothers. And, um, and he said, have you heard anything about, he didn't know that she was my girlfriend. And um, he said, have you heard anything about this film Vice Squad? I hear it's really amazing. And she said, well, actually that's my boyfriend is, is one of the writers and, and, and directed and is directing Vice Squad. And he said, no kidding, I wanna meet him. And he, he said, oh, and he knew who it was. He said, oh, you know, Gary Sherman? And she said, yeah, he said, oh, I love his movies. You know, I, I love Dead and Buried and and, uh, and I love, you know, Deathline and uh -huh. Doom. And um, he said, I'd love to meet him. So she picked up the phone, called me and said, Salman King's in my office and he wants to meet you. And I was in the cutting room. And uh, uh, I said, tell him, you know, I, I was, you know, well, they were at Burbank and I was over at, uh, Raleigh Studios um, in Hollywood across from Paramount. And um, uh, so he, he came over and uh, we met and became best friends. <laughs> it was unbelievable. And Zalman and I wrote a couple of scripts together and boom, boom. but uh, uh, shooting Vice Squad was great. We, we had a great time and Wings was great. And it wasn't until afterwards that, that Wings just went nuts and said you know everybody was calling me S S Sydney Lamet called me and and uh -huh. asked me about about wings and 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 Walter Hill called me and asked me about wings well anyways he, he did he did soldier's story with Lamet and yeah. um uh they do but he wasn't happy about doing it and then Walter offered him I don't remember what picture it was but Walter offered him a part in a film as a villain. And Walter had called me and, you know, to dump, and I, I gave Wings rave reviews. And uh, 
then about two weeks later, Walter called me back again and said, um, Wings turned down my offer. I said, what? He said, yeah, Wings turned it down. He said he didn't want to play the part. And I called Wings. I said, are you crazy? Why are you turning down an offer from Walter Hill? And he said, I don't want to play villains anymore. He said, you made me a villain and I don't want to be a villain. I want to be Greg Foster. I don't want to be Ramrod. And he says, I, I can't do it. He says, I can't do it. I, I can't separate myself from it. And I don't want to be those kind of people. And he never did another villain part again. Hmm. And, a, and I, I think it ruined his career. I mean, yep. I, I, he, he was a great villain. And he was too soppy as a, as a, as a love interest or a hero. You know, it, it didn't work for, for wings. He has the look, Gary, right? I yeah. mean, even if you, even before he speaks, he looks at those, those eyes, those eyes, his jaw structure, his face. He's just, that's what he is. You know? Yeah. And, uh, and I, I, uh, I felt really bad forever that he did that because I thought Wings, Wings could have been a major, major, major star mm -hmm. as a villain. And I mean, you know, he could have gotten into a franchise. Yeah. I mean, you know, where the villain was the, the star. Yes. And, and, you know, we've gotten to that point of, of films. I mean, if you, you know, how, how many films and television series are based on bad people. Yep. I mean, Breaking Bad, you know, I mean, uh, Mad Men, I mean, it, there's so many, or Mosquito Coast. I mean, where, where, where the, uh, where the lead in the, in the television series is a despicable human being. Tony Soprano. Yeah. Soprano. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we've, we've got, it just become, it's become a staple in television. To have bad guy leads and uh and especially, wings could have been one of them especially with streaming the short runs you know 10 12 episodes per season <clears throat> even if yeah well i know we're running a little long so i want to there's i mean there's a couple of people i gotta ask about rucker howard i gotta ask about gene simmons i mean you you became friendly with gene simmons yeah with gene gene <laughs> Uh, I became friends with Gene Simmons for a while until I just couldn't deal with his obsession with money. Um, Too much of and, a business person for you? Well, I mean, that's all he cares about. Yeah. I mean, he cares about getting his dick wet and he cares about money. <laughs> and and um, saying it just that way, because that's the most honest, <clears throat> one of the more honest answers I've ever heard on here. Yeah, it, it's... Um, and, and I mean, there's a real nice, there's a really good human being hidden <laughs> down buried, there inside. Buried, Gene. Deep buried. Yeah. And we, and we did become friends and we did a television series together and uh, after, after wanted, but you know, it's funny. I had moved to Chicago and I was in Chicago and one day my phone rings and it's wings and it says, have wings. It's Gene. He says, hi, I'm in Chicago. And I thought I'd call and say hello. Because otherwise you'd be pissed at me. <laughs> and I said, "Oh, you want to get together?" And he says, "Why? You got something we can make money with?" And I said, "No, I just thought we're friends and maybe we could get together and and have a bite to eat." And he says, "I don't have time to do anything except make money." Mm -hmm. And I said, you, "You're you're serious, aren't you?" Because I thought he was being facetious at first. And he says, "Yeah." He says, "That's you know." He says, unless there's a reason to do something, I don't do it. Yeah. And I and I just basically said to him, you know what, Gene? Thanks, but no thanks. Goodbye. But and, I bet and, you I bet you have a lot of good stories out of that short friendship. Yeah, I mean, Gene, I you know, Gene's great. I, I was with him when he bought his house in Benedict Canyon. And he, he went in and just you know, he looked at the house and he said, okay, I want to buy the house. And he said, and they, they were asking like, I don't know, I don't remember the numbers. Let's say they were asking 3 million. And he said, I'll give you 2 million. I'll give you cash right now. Uh -huh. 
and just pack up your things and move out and leave the furniture behind. <laughs> that was Gene. I mean, e everything about Gene is just. Um, but you know, he 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 was a friend when I needed a friend, and uh, you know, the television series we did together was weird. He was going to star in it, but after the second day of shooting, he realized that that it was a single male lead show, yeah. and that he would be in every scene, and he just could not could not deal with that kind of pressure. Are, is it Sable? Are we talking about Sable? Yeah, it was Sable, yeah. Right. Which was a superhero show. Yeah, and and Gene, Gene had bought the comic book. Gene, Gene pitched the show to ABC. Uh, I was actually away. What was it? I was doing something. I think I was doing a pilot in New York and for uh, another show. Uh, it was a NBC show I was shooting, and Gene had taken this to ABC, and um, uh, ABC said, "Boy, uh, yeah, we'll do that. We'll do this pilot, um, or get you know." He said, "But he said you're close with Gary Sherman, aren't you?" And they said, "Yeah." And Gene said, "Yeah." And he said, "Well, if you can get Gary Sherman to write and direct the pilot, we'll give you a go on the show." And um, so anyways, uh, I, I was, where were, I was off some, oh, I was in Connecticut at, um, uh, at, with some friends and um, I, somebody comes to me and said, Gene Simmons is on the phone for you. <laughs> and I, I said to Gene, how the hell did you get my number? I mean, this was before, you know, we yeah. were all calling on cell phones back then. And uh, he said, oh, I have my ways. Anyways, he said, I just left a meeting at ABC and I've got a, I, I, I bought this comic book. I bought the rights to this comic book and um, and I just got a, ABC said, if you'll direct it and write it, they'll make it. And he said, so you're gonna do it. <laughs> So anyways, I came back to Los Angeles and uh, sat down with Gene and we decided and we met with ABC and uh, I wrote the the pilot. Um, and uh, and I think, oh, I wrote the pilot with um, uh, I don't Brian, have Brian Taggart and I wrote the pilot together. Brian Taggart and I had written Wanted Dead or Alive together. Yeah. And uh, and we worked on some other stuff, and we and we done poltergeist. We did poltergeist together as well. Um, and uh, um, so, anyways, we wrote it, and they greenlit it, and uh, did it. And well, like I said, in the second day of shooting, Gene just said, "I can't do this." And so then we had to stop production and recast and 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 did it. And we made the show and the show was really, really received very well. And then we this was 1988 mm -hmm. and we hit the hit the writer's strike and got shut down by the writer's strike. And that was the end of the show. We did eight episodes, I think, seven or eight episodes, and then got shut down by the strike and that was the end of it you yeah. know it was too bad because it, it was really a good show i really enjoyed doing you that think show. that's one of those things if you were now you'd streaming it would be a huge you know with the boys and all the other superhero shows that are out there oh i think sable could work today yeah um i think sable could work today in a big way yeah uh and you know, and we we shot it in a way that nobody had ever shot it. Alex the Pomishi, uh brought Alex in to shoot the show, and it, you know, it was a comic book, and the way the comic book was drawn, it looked like neon. So we decided to light, light the entire show with neon and fluorescence, mm -hmm. and nobody had ever done anything like that before. The look of the show was fantastic. And, you know, because there was only eight episodes, it kind of vanished. And I, I, I think there's some episodes on YouTube um, 
that you can that you can pull up and watch but they're so bad i mean the Quality. the the transfers and um, you know somebody just pirated it and transferred it to and you, you can't see the beauty i mean uh, the, the scenes were just exquisite the the photography was just exquisite and and we actually did light it with neon we we had all these neon lights built and, yeah. and all these fluorescent fixtures and in great colors um and uh and the whole thing's lit like a comic book and i, I don't think anybody had ever really done anything quite like that before but maybe bugsy was the closest yeah so in the interest of time i want to hit on a couple of things yeah we've been almost two hours i'm sorry but it's been, it's been a great conversation and i appreciate it but i you know i want to a little bit about rucker Hauer, and then if we don't mind so best memory worst memory whatever you'd like to say about him i he's a character in working with rucker was great he he was hard he he's a perfectionist and he demands perfection from everybody around him. and and i and i appreciated that and uh he he just really he wanted me to direct him he yeah. didn't want to walk through that part and and you know the scene where he starts crying he he was you know after the boat gets blown up and he's in the car with robert guillaume mm -hmm. and and he starts to cry he said to me he said i've never cried in real life how do you expect me to cry on screen <laughs> and and we really had to we really worked that scene until I got him to the point that he could cry. And he didn't want, he didn't want fake tears or anything. He wanted, he said, if I can't cry, I won't do the scene. And uh, he, he got himself worked up to the point that, that he was actually crying. And um, it was a pretty amazing moment. I mean, you know, I didn't. Rutger was not my first choice. Who was your to, first to choice? Play the part, um, Mel Gibson. Yeah. And and Mel Gibson wasn't a star yet in in the United States. I, I had, you know, seen him in Mad Max and, and um, this right before Lethal Weapon, right? Le he, he, you're probably shooting. Yes, right before Lethal it was Weapon. before. Yeah, yep, yeah. um, and. Uh, uh it was before lethal weapon and i really fought to get mel but his his agent really wanted a lot of money for him because they knew that you know uh road warrior was going to make him a big star and uh, mm -hmm. um <clears throat> and but i loved him in mad max you know which was the one that preceded you know yep. when he was a detective and uh and so anyways, he, he wanted like a million dollars. And the, and so Rutger, they, they went to Rutger's agent and Rutger's agent was really fighting for him to get this part. And they offered him for a half a million dollars with a half a million dollars deferred. And the studio said, yeah, we're gonna go that way. So, um, that's what happened. <laughs> so we ended up uh, <clears throat> with Rutger, which was great. I mean, I think that the difference would have been that that um, it, it would have been the same movie, yeah. but it would have been a giant hit with Mel Gibson. Yeah. It would have been a giant hit. It would have changed m my life in a major way. Yeah. Um, which I don't really care about. I mean, I, I, I was not, I not in this game for the money. If right. I was in the game for the money, I would have kept making commercials because I made so much money making commercials. Uh. Um, and, and television has been very, very good to me. So I, I have no complaints, but, um, uh, well, as we uh, wind up, let's talk a little bit about the practical effects because i told you before we started i didn't really want to i think the poltergeist three a lot of poltergeist three stories are well-worn territory 
and I, I don't want you to have to keep talking about it, but you know, the effects in it are important. And you say you still talk about it. And then, you know, as we lead into that, maybe just into your teaching, because clearly when you're talking about them and not in the optical, but the mechanical effects, right? In Paul yeah, Jones. there's no optical effects. Right. There's not a single optical effect. All mechanical in, in, effects. It's all practical in the camera. Mm -hmm. My, my whole, you know, we've mentioned Jay and Laddie a million times in this. Uh, but I love it. You mentioned interview. them all you want. You mentioned them all you want. Well, they, Jay called me. They, they had just taken over MGM. They had moved from the, the lead company at, at mm -hmm. Warner Brothers and <clears throat> they became the uh, rulers at MGM. Kikorian convinced them to come run MGM. So they were running MGM. And I, I had been involved in the Poltergeist franchise from, from almost the beginning. And um, I had been asked to do Poltergeist 2, mm -hmm. which I wasn't available. And, and, and I also wasn't interested. Um, but I, I, you know, had, had gone to a lot of meetings and da, 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 da. anyways I didn't do Poltergeist 2 I, I really wasn't interested in doing it and um, so they called me and they said okay and and nobody was very happy unfortunately with Poltergeist 2 and so they called me and they said we want you to do Poltergeist 3 and I said Oh, that's very nice of you, but no, thank you. Yeah, you just turned down two. What's going to make you think, oh, my God, three. Three is the one. Three is the one. Yeah, I mean, and I said, you know, guys, I'm really not interested. And Jay says, we're asking you to do it. And, you know, we know that we can trust you to deliver a good movie and 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 and, and stay within budget and because we know what you can do and uh, I said well let me think about it because it's not my it's it, it's not my my arena it, you yeah. know it's supernatural it, it's um it's not political mm -hmm. you know every one of my films has, has carried a political message and there and there was no way of being political with poltergeist and the, you know the, the the theme had already been set you couldn't go that far away mm -hmm. and the characters were were you know set in cement so i came back to them and i said i'll tell you what i've always wanted to shoot a film in the john hancock building in chicago <laughs> so if I can haunt the John Hancock building and shoot, actually shoot the whole film in Chicago, because I wanted to spend some time in Chicago. Um, it's where I grew up and I had friends there and I, I just wanted to be in Chicago for a while. I said, so if I can shoot the show at the John Hancock building in Chicago, number one, and number two, I can do all the effects practical. Yeah. And they said, what are you crazy? And I said, no, I said, I, it was a bit of an ego trip. I, I had done a film called the mysterious two for NBC, uh -huh. which, which probably had the first use of CGI ever in a, in a film. And we didn't even realize that that's what it was when we did it. It just, there was an effect in, in Mysterious 2 that I couldn't figure out any way to do, except I had been reading about computers. I mean, this was, you know, in 1980 or something. And yeah, so um, do you think you predated, Rathacon came out in 82 and that had some of the first CGI. Oh, this was 78. 78, yeah. So it is, it's four years beforehand. And and we, we did this this computerized effect, which I, I won't go into because it take too long. But I, I had read about this guy, Wyndham Hannaway, who was working in Boulder, Colorado on medical imaging using a computer. And I saw some of the stuff that he was doing. And uh, I'm, I'm a real technophile. I, I love technology. And so I called Wyndham and I said, 
You know what? I have an idea of creating something on a computer that I can transfer into film. I, it, it, it's basically a geometric shape that 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 morphs, and I and I can't figure out any way to do it practically without you know building models that are going to cost a, a billion dollars and 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 it's and it, it basically is 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 possibly impossible to create it physically but i think it could be done on a computer and i told him what it was and he said Let, let's talk about it so I, I flew out to boulder and we met and uh he had access to the cray at, at ncar at the national center of atmospheric research because uh -huh. uh, he, he was at the university of, of colorado and <clears throat> In, in Boulder. And the Cray at the time was the most powerful computer on the planet. And um, uh, and it was huge. I mean, it was the size of a building. Yeah. Um, and uh, so anyways, we we took this shape and did a line drawing and, and played with it on the computer and it, it ended up being able to do it. Then we had to figure out how to transfer it and so we used an electron gun stimulator on microfilm mm -hmm. to to create to to do each frame. It took like <laughs> an hour to do every frame. I mean, it took days mm -hmm. for us when we created it on the computer to transfer it to the microfilm, and then we transferred it to the microfilm. I took the microfilm onto an optical printer and created traveling mats. And we combined it with the film and, and did it. But anyways, so I no nobody else credits me, but I credit me with <laughs> having done the first CGI. So my 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 ego trip w w with with Poltergeist three is I wanted to do the last major movie that didn't use a single bit of CGI. Yeah, because <laughs> CGI was taking over at that point. And so I said, I, I want to do a film without any CGI, with no opticals whatsoever, not even a dissolve. And, uh, you know, so the only thing that that's second generation in, in there is the titles. Yeah. A everything else was created. And, and then the, the, the lightning strike at the end, which we did. We did it optically. We didn't do it with a computer. But mm -hmm. um, so there's no computer stuff. So it's only in the title sequences at the beginning and at the end that, that there's any opticals. But from the time the says directed by Gary Sherman to the time it says the end, every effect is practical. And we did and a lot and you know, so anyways, it was really Andrea, my, my friend Andrea Sabasen. At, at, at Rue Morgue, who had said to me, we want you to come up and do a lecture. We do a lecture series called the Black Museum and we want you to do a lecture. And I said, oh, what should I do a lecture on? And we talked about it. And then she said to me, she said, you know, she said, Poltergeist 3 is an, she was the one that said it, said Poltergeist 3 is an encyclopedia of, of practical effects. And everybody wants practical effects these days. And I said, wow, yeah. So this was about four or five years ago. And so I put together a, a, a lecture, a, a three hour lecture yeah. on, on the practical effects of Poltergeist 3. So we did it in Toronto um, and it, it got reviewed and it, 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 people got excited about it. And then a film festival started calling me and asking me if I wanted to come do it. So I've done it everywhere i mean i've done it literally literally all over the world and, and but you had uh, been teaching too right because you taught at columbia yeah i taught at columbia i did a year at columbia as an artist in residence and so, uh, and i may end up as, as the, the 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 act three of my career may be as teacher as well um there's a, a a school in the UK, a university in the UK that's been asking me if I would be interested in doing a long-term residency there, which when I decide to stop working, <laughs> I, I may take them up on that and but be the final like, act. Do you like, do you like I it? Love I love teaching. Yeah. I, I, I lecture 
every once in a while. Um, I've done it live a couple of times and, and, on, and on Skype and now Zoom a few times at the University of Aberystwyth mm -hmm. in Wales. And they, they have a doctoral program in critical film studies. And I love lecturing to those kids because, I mean, I learn more from them than they learn from me. I'll tell you, it, it's really amazing to have these kids who are doing their doctorate in, in critical film studies and, and, and just discussing things with them. I find it absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Well, Gary, I, I can't thank you enough for your time. I think that's a great, I, and I know you were more than generous with your time, but I think we've had a great conversation. We've had a, a trip down memory lane and our, our fans are just going to love this. So thank you again for everything. I'm going to stop recording and then we will end it here. I appreciate it, Mr. Sherman. Thank you for all the great entertainment and thank you for that grimy feeling. I still feel <laughs> by squad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Vice Squad. I love Vice Squad. I watch it myself all the time. I, all mean, right. I, I love showing it to people. So you take care. All right. Thank you. Grrrr. <sighs>